Welcome to the Supply Side Studio. I am here today at Supply Side West. This is the second day of the uh, Expo Hall uh, open. You can see all the bustling behind. And uh, I'm going to be talking to some incredible folks today about JEDI. That's justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So uh, first off with me, I have Anand Sobrup, uh, founder and president of CEFIM. And I also have Rajat uh, Mittal Shah, who's a co-founder and executive director of Nutriventia. Yes, yay. <laughs> so thank you both first for uh, joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Thanks, Sonia. I know that when I first was, this is actually my first supply side west. Um, and when I was given the assignment, which I feel so blessed because I might be new to the industry, I might be new to Supply Side West, but I'm not new to uh, JEDI and uh, having equity and diversity and justice for all. So um, I had actually read an article on Natural Products Insider about the work that you're doing, Anand. Um, with your company, and I wanted you, I know that not everybody reads Natural Products Insider, but you should, and uh, I wanted you to kind of give us a recap of the, the studies that your, your company had found. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as you know, everything uh, in this area, when we talk about JEDI, and, and now we have acronyms to describe it, but it's simply about, uh, simply about doing a, a good thing. Uh, simply about doing the right thing and uh, just like anything I, I learned this thing I learned thing this thing visiting one of the farms uh, where we are buying our raw material from in this case we are, we are buying uh, fenugreek seed uh, from this farm and I saw you know I just want to recap the story it's just it's so exciting Please. sometime you know I, I look back it's almost uh, seven eight years back uh, and I saw a bunch of people cleaning up uh, those seeds. And, and, and there was one woman in that group of people who were cleaning this up. And while uh, the men in the group, they were cleaning it fast, and, and the, the last woman, uh, she was taking her time to clean it up and put it in the bags. And I was watching this entire group working, and, and I was wondering that uh, this last bag is small, but it's the best seeds because there are no debris, there's nothing else. I'm just getting pure seed out of that. Uh, I walked to the other room and to ask the supervisor, I hope we are paying the best. Uh, she's one of the best people you have. And he said, oh, no, we, she's slow. And I was wondering that th this is so, so unlikely because the seeds coming from that bag, I don't have to spend extra money, extra time, extra solvents, extra steps to actually clean it. I would be spending less energy and that should be paid the highest. I was perplexed and then after lunch I came back and I asked that lady that why you were really giving this much of attention to it and, and she said that, oh, it's gonna be somebody's food. And that hit me like a rock. That, that, that perspective we don't have as men. Looking at, at a supply of food supply in, in the eyes of a woman who's a mother, who's, who's a family, you know. And, and, and they look at, at each and every part that somebody's going to end up eating it. It has to be clean. Uh, I came back, I, I thought of, of actually preaching these guys, you know, how, how to really do, go about it, but it all failed. Literally it failed. That you, you don't know anything about it. Just leave it to us. We just keep on doing things we're doing and then then the idea hit to me that what if we use data to convince people? And I started gathering data, it, it was late, uh, it's almost a year after this interaction. We started gathering data on, on the farms where we are buying raw material from. Are they run by women? Are they taking care of women better? And is it going to really, you know, affecting our, our bottom lines? And we found some really good data out there. If these farms are owned by women, run by women, or the farms where they're taking better care of women are providing daycare, having facilities for their children, we are getting a better seeds or better raw materials out of that. And now we are using, you know, we are trying to create something simpler, a very simple presentation to every other farm that 
look at those guys. They are making more money on the same raw material than you. If you do the right thing, you might be in the same league. So that that's that's my uh, idea of actually looking at this entire supply chain and 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 how the database gender equity can be done. So has that been um, your exper experience? Uh, does that what he say kind of resonate with you? you know, professionally, as a woman who lives in India and is a business owner? Every day, right? So, um, I'm going to just support what Anand's saying by telling you about in 2022, there was a global survey done, and the question that was asked that, are women better at leading the nation, in fact, that was the question. And 85% of Indians actually responded uh, saying yes, which is which is far more than any other country. This was a global survey. And when you look at India, um, from the 1960s, we've actually had a female prime minister. Since then, we've had two female presidents, including our current uh, president of India. And each one of them have really, there's already a very strong precedent for women to lead in India. So I think um, India is kind of ripe for a lot of these kind of changes to happen. We already have some of it, but our sheer numbers make our percentages look significantly smaller or bigger, depending on what you're looking at. And um, to go into my own personal experience, um, Sonia, I was um, a second girl child, um, born in a family where I can fairly say that my grandparents didn't do like a you know, parade when I was born because, again, second girl child. When I decided to do my post-graduation in um, the United States, I actually have a lot of family who's already immigrated to the United States. They were the ones who cautioned my parents that she will become too independent, um, difficult to get married then too. Um, and it was almost like, you know, to aspire to do big things is almost like you're committing a crime. But luckily for me, I had um, my parents who were my rock, my mom who wanted me to do everything that she was not able to do in her time, a father who saw, um, not a girl or a boy, but simply a budding entrepreneur, really out there to chase her dreams. And when you fast forward today, I'm at the helm of running um, NutriVenture, which has been co-founded by me and my husband. And you would think that my need for requiring external validation is no longer there, but not quite. Every now and then I do have Vishal, uh, my husband, who has to kind of amplify my voice. And it's not like people are um, not listening or deaf in the room, they just sometimes are wearing earplugs, right? So every now and then I do still have that need, but to be very honest, my own journey has been very smooth. Um, there not been as many bumps as, you know, it makes it sound. And once you reach to a certain place, you're almost used to, um, and you get conditioned and you get trained to kind of ignore um, and bypass these naysayers. But going back to what, you know, Anand was talking about, I definitely think, you know, women bring such an important perspective in the workplace. They are definitely more nurturing, and it's about that diversity. I don't think it's just about you know only women being at the top. I think just like in a house, it's about you know how I have a nine-year-old. It's about co-parenting and co-parenting well. I think that same kind of um, responsibility needs to come at the top. Women definitely need to be acknowledged and be given more role, and I think. Just speaking again from my own experience, a lot of times we don't have that much confidence in ourselves that others do. So when you talk about, you know, I'm just throwing a big term out there called the imposter syndrome, but it's real, right? So I think women need to know what to ask for also. Like why wouldn't this lady have gone and asked, hey, I'm doing a better job, right? Why am I not being paid more? So we do what we do without necessarily expecting um, to get more, but I think we should be asking for these things. Anand, I also wanted to um, loop back to that article that I'd read because I think that you said that you were going to get results from the data analysis 
and can you talk about some of the specific goals that you plan to implement? Absolutely, so we have the basic data in our hands and, and, and this is what we're gonna do. We're going to basically publish it uh, somewhere uh, very soon and also we are basically giving, we're leading with the data that, that look at the data, what has happened. All the farms who have taken better care of their, all were their employees, just not the women. Better, better care for the men also, and, and, and they are faring better. So anybody who's leading by doing justified things are doing better in the supply chain. So my idea is to that, to the next step to the whole thing, that these are the metrics, these are the parameters, these are the basics on which we're gonna look at everybody in our supply chain down the line. Because what we have found that there is a good number of farms good number of employers out there who wanted to do and are doing the right thing. We just need to bring them up. So the data which we have, we are pre prepared now, we are going to lay down in a matrix and we give the matrix down the line to people in very simple language, uh, maxima two or three bullet points that if you do that, this is what you're gonna get. So just break it down to the level of dollars and cents, which is very easy to understand for a business person because this is beyond justice. This is a good business case. Look at this. This makes absolutely good business sense to do the right thing. Because you do the right thing, you're going to reward it the same, same way. Because the words are around is changing. It's not the same anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I know that you two have uh, spoken together and you actually are both uh, partners and advocate for change is something that you both do. Um, you have partnerships with WIN. I wanted to congratulate you for being the first global liaison for WIN, that's Women in Nutraceuticals in India. So tell me, how did that come to be? A little bit about WIN and your role as the first global liaison. Thank you, Sonia, for the congratulations, but the commendation completely goes to WIN for such forward thinking about creating this change about in gender equity. Um, and if my story that I just unpacked a few seconds ago has anything to say, when I started hearing about when I was truly inspired, it is something that I felt that I could get ahead of and I could definitely help in. So it was almost a year ago at Last Supply Side West, I met with Heather Granato and Linda Doyle and when we talked about this more, it really crystallized for me that we need the same transformative approach in India. And there's no reason to recreate something. We want to push the global movement to bring that to India. And when you think about India, it is at the um, global stage. It is one of the leaders in the nutraceutical industry. It's teeming with innovative companies. But a lot of times when you want to join global movements like this, there are simple hurdles like location, distance, and time zones, which does make it difficult. And so what WIN has done, and very fast uh, they acted on this, we created this global liaison position, which I'm extremely honored. It's a huge responsibility, and I do hope I do justice to it. But it was very timely, and it's almost invaluable, because now with this, there is an opportunity to create real change. And to unpack what WIN does is at its core, it's about empowering women and pushing them forward um, in the nutraceutical supply chain. And by doing that, you really have to uh, break your barriers for unequal pay, limited representation, limited funding. And when you think about, you know, these are all problems in any country. And if you take this forward in India, there are also problems that are unique to India. For instance, we have a great percentage of women who leave the workplace after childbirth. And a lot of them who do return are not able to sustain and never progress further in their careers. So these are, um, again, I wouldn't say unique, but the numbers are significant in India. And this is something that when you think about a more regional strategy and these nuances, that's kind of what we can do with the global liaison position. Um, just to take it another step further, what I want to see is in the long run, so short run, 
we will do um, a couple of things. Uh, we want to create a great coalition of sponsors, partners, and members. But long run, also working with the local government, if you can impact policies, that's going to have a lasting impact, which will make all the difference. So I do want to take this opportunity on the stage to have um, talked to everybody here at Supply Side West. I'm here. Please come and talk to me if you're from India, if you want to be able to sponsor and get ahead of this and show your leadership in this area, then let's have a conversation. And worst case, I'll give you five days. Let's get back to India. Let's settle down after the adrenaline that we all are facing with supply side. And then let's have this conversation. But I do need, um, it's not a one person job. We're going to need an entire army, an entire group of people to be able to kickstart and make a difference in India. Wonderful. That's really great. And I'm sure that you all heard that call to action there. For, so please do reach out to her. Um, I know the last thing that I wanted to ask you guys, and I want both of your input, was I think that I had watched a, a panel discussion that you guys both were on before, and I know that you've talked a lot together. I would love to hear one or two best practices about how the nutraceutical industry can reduce the gender gap. Uh, the best thing, uh, you know, once, once you look at gender gap and, and, and look at the lack of women in the C-suite in, in nutraceutical industry, it, it's really remarkable. Uh, you know, we were looking at uh, what Heather presented uh, doing Nutrify uh, to their summit in Mumbai, India last year, uh, this year actually. And it was a uh, real eye-opener uh, to see that, that numbers. And, and knowing that so many women are in this industry, why they're not rising up to, to the higher position? Because this, is, this industry is all about wellness, a wellness of family. And we all know this is all centered around women. That's the center part of the family. If we are not having that voice in, in the C-suite, how are we going to address the entire concern? How can we keep on formulating in our silos, not really listening to people who are stakeholders, not bringing them? And then this goes beyond you know, just having looking at, 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 at a gender parity here. You have to look at you are using a traditional knowledge from a country, from a faraway land. And how they are not part of a conversation. If you're taking away somebody's herb, which is a medicine for them, for utilization in a different country, why they're not being, again, a part of a conversation? Why they don't have a space on the table? Why don't we involve them to figure out if it is affecting their lives some way? So this just goes beyond a gender parity. We are looking at a larger picture where we have to be inclusive, having at least open our ears to listen to them, to, to bring them on table and, 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 and learn from them. Learn at the ground level what's going on, how taking a turmeric out of your food every day is going to affect your life. So th this goes beyond that. And you know, I think it's the time for us to have those conversations, uh, to have open dialogue, and, and, and bring this to a forefront. Then only we are actually looking at a real addressing a Jedi issue in our industry. I would say that for any company, if we are truly just purely hiring based on merit and we leave gender on the side, you will automatically see the gender gap closing. And I'm very proud that in our parent company, Inventure and NutriVenture, we followed that. At NutriVenture, we actually have 58% women as compared to men, right? And there is, I don't think, unequal pay is even a question, I would have never let that happen <laughs> uh, first. Um, and I think that's why, you know, when you have leadership and representation at the top, automatically a lot of these problems get solved. So I think when companies do the right thing, which is what Anand was saying too, things automatically change. And I think there are two very important things for our industry. One is when you have women in leadership positions, you're going to create products which makes sense for women who is your prime purchaser and that will make a difference in your top line. So if nothing else, see how you can make that happen. And um, of course, um, you know, the other best practice is definitely allowing for that flexibility. I had three women in my team, all three pregnant at the same time. 
and giving them that flexibility during their pregnancy after childbirth, I think it makes a lot of difference. And honestly, I'm getting a lot of their, um, I would say, loyalty for life now because that's when I supported them. And they're amazing. They didn't, none of this matter. They did what they need to. It's been three months. They're ready to like come back to work. Um, and get started. So I think that flexibility is an extremely important practice that a lot of companies need to bring in and um, giving them that time, uh, which honestly pays off in the long run. Wonderful. I really appreciate you both for joining me today. Um, I feel honored to be in both of your company and uh, please join us in just a little bit. We're going to have a couple guests next. We have Linda Doyle and Ian Dean who will be joining us on the stage. Thank you, Sonia. Welcome back. We are in the Supply Side studio here at Supply Side West. We're talking about Jedi. There are so many things to talk about in, that you're going to be talking about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And one of the topics that's not talked about very often is ageism. So I thought, how great to have two people we're gonna say mature on, on the mature end <laughs> and on the younger side. So we have Linda Doyle, uh, president and CEO of Avant Nutrition, and Ian Dean, who is technical sales manager of Kemen Human Nutrition and Health. Thank you guys for joining me. So Thank much. you, Sonia, for yeah. having us. I'm super excited to be here and glad to participate in this discussion. Wonderful, yeah. Sonia, thank you. This is really fun. I'm looking forward to the discussion, but thank you for having us. Absolutely. I know that we actually, we had a lot of fun when we had these, you know, preparation calls too, because there's so many things to talk about, especially if you're thinking about um, ageism. It's not just uh, for younger people, it's for older people as well. Um, but I wanted to start with you, Linda, with you were a new person in the industry I don't know, I don't, a while ago. Quite a few years ago, yes. And um, did you experience ageism discrimination based on your age when you were first, you know, new to the industry? Can you talk about that? Oh, I sure can, absolutely. Thanks, Sonia. Um, I've been in the industry over 34 years. I forgive my voice today. And when I first started out, um, quite young and inexperienced, of course, um, and, you know, it was always people looked at me as, oh, you're a pretty young girl and kind of pat me on the back, smiled and, and went on my way. And when I was in sales, kind of the same thing. At that point, I did have an MBA and an MS in, an, an MS in human nutrition. And my one boss had actually said, why don't you put those on your card? Just put the markers on your card and, and the, and the uh, degrees. And it was interesting. The same conversation a week later had done a 180, which was really interesting because the person saw this on my card while the week before when I was talking to them. They didn't see this, they didn't really expect anything like that. So just from what I looked like at the time um, and being young and new, and again, like I said, very naive in the industry and to business, it, it made a huge difference. So Ian, the same question to you, have you experienced discrimination or challenges based on your age and being relatively new to the industry? Yeah, to that point, um, a little bit of both. I think for me, there's this element of confidence equaling competency. And I conduct my business in a very idiosyncratic manner. Like I am, I'm highly individual in my routines and my mannerisms and things like that. And so coming into the industry, I think it just took enough of just interacting with people, interacting with individuals for them to kind of upfront, maybe not give me the respect that I feel like I deserve or that I, I should be given based on my skill set and my background. But within like a 15 to 20 minute conversation, people start to understand maybe these preconceived images they had in their head of a younger person and what they're like. I'm not like that. And so it's been an element of just understanding that that's at play with particularly some older folks that have been around the industry, like what does this kid know and how could he help me really? Like I've been around for so long, I know it all. And so I think it's been diffusing some of those 
preconceived notions uh, in my head internally, understanding they might have that, and then just just building a, a level of competency where I feel like I can um, come to them and bring them solutions, be of service to them, and and that's been that's been huge for me to kind of get my career up off the ground and build relationships, build build connections where people feel comfortable coming to me and for support and help and and connections within the industry. Linda. I know that it's kind of like on the flip side, I asked you how, you know, your experience was when you first began in the industry. And now that you said, what is it, 34 years? Yes. That's impressive. 34 years in the industry. Have you witnessed ageism, discrimination based on age for people who are older? Or is this industry kind of a, a more accommodating or, or, you know, there's a, a lot of folks who are older in the industry as well. I think with, with this, it's really important. and. The fact that you're asking about the industry and highlighting the nutraceutical industry, personally, I don't believe it's as bad necessarily in this industry. This industry is a family. People respect, I think there are a lot of individuals in this industry who have been around a very long time and have garnered a lot of respect for their knowledge, experience, and what they've brought to the industry. So I think from that end, um, we do see that type of respect. I have seen in other companies or other industries where and actually, it's just interesting. I should be careful what I'm saying, um, not be so broad, but where companies are cleaning house, search, oh, making overlays and, and good excuses to maybe um, change up by removing some of the older individuals in the company and make way for newer, younger individuals to, to take place. I mean, when you think about it, there are uh, you know, unconscious biases in everyone. And, you know, thinking, well, you're older, you don't have the digital experience or you don't know anything about AI. Um, so, and I am a dinosaur. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, there are a lot of individuals who keep relevant. And I think that's the importance here is to keep your relevance. First, you have to become relevant. Just like, you know, Ian, like you were talking about, so well said. And once you can establish your relevance and establish your experience and let people know what you're capable of, the, the the real important thing is never stop learning and never stop try, you know, keep an open mind and try to understand where the whole industry is coming from, what younger individuals are bringing into the marketplace. So. so Ian, what is the best way that you found to kind of diffuse people's opinion of you as an older person? I know that sometimes you, you said that people will look at you and have a preconceived idea yeah. based on your age. Um, one of the biggest things that I'm super grateful for, because it was really out of my control, is the mentorship I've received at Chem and Health. I have a wonderful, wonderful manager who knows how I work, knows how I like to work, allows me to operate autonomously within my own schedule, but then understand like there are deadlines to meet, there are things to, to achieve in the business. And so having her just guiding force in terms of how to navigate these relationships, um, also just her her reputation within the industry has allowed me to get my foot in the door with a lot of these customers and have them actually believe that, okay, well, if Kemen hired this guy and Joanne likes working with him, like, I, I should probably listen to him because he, he has to know a thing or two. Kemen knows a thing or two. And so it's almost been piggybacking off of the reputation of both my manager and Kemen as a whole. We we do things the right way in this industry, and I think people that, that look for those sorts of ingredients recognize that. And so just using that mentorship that's been available to me, um, still paving my own path, bringing my own personality to it, um, people just recognize early on like this, yes, he may be young, but he's, he's a little different and, and uh, different in a good way, I would like to say, or I'd like to think at least. So um, it's, been, it's been a blessing to both have that incredible mentorship, um, but then also be able to, to find an organization like Kemen that has allowed me to be myself and create my own sort of image within the industry. That's, that's one thing that my manager has always told me is like, don't be a robot, don't be what I, like I'll give you a framework, but put your personality in that. Like don't, don't show up and put on a facade every day, be yourself, connect authentically with these customers and these people, and that'll show through in those interactions. So that's kind of what I've yeah. been doing for that. Linda, you know that I wanna to talk to you about mentorship, but before I do, I also, Ian, I wanted to say, you know, during the call that we were talking um, beforehand, you said that 
actually your age has almost been a benefit in some of the conversations. Like people will come up to you and be like, hey, uh, uh, you're, what are, are you a Gen Z? Gen Z, Gen Z, yep. <laughs> hey, Gen, Gen Z. Z. Uh, what about X, Y, and Z, or you know what I mean? Yes, so. no, absolutely. So that that was another thing that I did want to touch on is like the team has been so receptive to to my input and having sort of maybe more of a like I grew up with technology around me in school and social media apps and understanding how like there's a huge marketing channel on these platforms now and understanding what's the buzzwords, what's popular, what's trending. Um, from an even artificial intelligence perspective, like I've been considered the AI rep for the Kemen team because I'm supposed to know those things, but I also take an interest in them and I like using ChatGPT to expedite my workflows and implement things to just like most things that people don't think of. And so it's uh, it's been wonderful to have a team that's not so old school or stuck in their ways where they're not open and receptive to learning new things or having almost novel inputs. I think. There's, on both ends of the spectrum, any way you spin it, like a young person has advantages in XYZ domain because they're young, they have nothing to lose, they can grow their reputation. An old person is wise, has incredible experience and wisdom. And so it's just a matter of like, you know what you bring to the table and spinning it as a value add, a, a value proposition is is so key into navigating these relationships and, and building a brand within this industry. Yeah, absolutely. So Linda, I think the question that I had asked when we were talking beforehand was like, how does mentoring and mentorship, and I know that Ian had just kind of touched on that, how does that help to diffuse um, ageism or, or to help you know navigate through that? Can you talk about that and, and your Absolutely, experience? absolutely. And first I want to say, Ian, you're saying work smarter, not harder, which is really great to hear. Yes, <laughs> so. yes. <laughs> So, no, when it comes to mentorship, mentorship is actually a two-way street when you think about it because you have mentors who have experience, who've been around, they can share their experiences, they can kind of work on soft skills and kind of navigate, help you navigate and help guide you and help develop a career. On the other hand, the mentors have been around their experience and we talked earlier about keeping relevant, having younger mentees they also will learn from the mentee, sort of, you know, you're talking AI and you're talking about how, you, how you've grown already, which you, uh, tremendous. And I think that combination really makes sense because now you've got two people working together and both of them are really gaining benefit. I think from a mentorship too, it's also, and, and I, I will talk about the Women in Nutraceuticals Mentorship Program in a moment because I think that we should bring it up, um, is networking. And I think that's a really critical piece, is really networking in a very successful and professional way, getting to know individuals in the, in the industry, getting to know peers, but getting to know experienced individuals who can also help navigate or help you navigate what you're, where you'd like to go and help you kind of figure out where you want to go. Because a lot of people, in, when you're younger, I can tell you what I thought I was going to be back then. Um, first female president of the U.S. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> There's still time. Yeah. No, thank you. I'm, I'm no. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, no, but in, in reality, you know, I've been very fortunate to have mentors along the way that have really helped coach and guide me. So it's, you know, from that perspective, but that network and building that way, that is really important. And I mentioned the WIN networking program. Yes, you're involved in yes. a mentorship program with uh, Women in Nutraceuticals with WIN, yes. so please tell us about that. Sure, we're actually getting ready to launch the pilot program. It's a six-month program. Um, it is uh, mentoring women, and the reason we're looking at to mentor women is that one of the uh, goals or the real vision of, of WIN is to bring more gender diversity to leadership. And that diversity, we, we see that diversity is really critical to the success of a company, to its profitability, to its innovation. And I'm gonna just step aside for a second on diversity. Diversity is having younger individuals, new individuals to the industry. So it has to do with people who talk so much about age as much as they do about gender, race, et cetera. Um, but that diversity is really critical because again, you feed off each other and it really, really works. So with WIN, we are looking to bring more women to the leadership of this industry and help elevate the industry in doing so. The program that we have, it's a six month program. We are looking at working on soft skills. So effective communications, 
uh, critical thinking, creativity, self-awareness. And what we're doing is we have a, we'll have these in cohorts. So this pilot um, program, we are working with uh, women who are looking to advance their careers into the leadership position, into C-suite, into board positions, and are committed to objective feedback, open feedback, because that's very important, and committed to actually developing their careers. And we are working with mentors who are both men and women who are committed to helping support women in their journey in their career advancement. So it's really exciting. We're going to be bringing together um, a matching program. So we're trying to bring together the right mentors and mentees, but at the same time, it's also a cohort. So what we're doing is allowing the group, or not allowing the group, but enabling the group to develop a network. So they'll have a network of their peers, a network with mentors, so they all learn from each other. How can people learn more about WIN? So with WIN, if we go to www.womeninnutraceuticals.org, and there is a mentor tab, and if you go to the tab, there's an application for the mentor program for both mentors and mentees. For the first cohort, the deadline is November 1st. However, it doesn't mean that not put in an application because we will be having future cohorts next year. We'll be expanding the program actually to incorporate mid-level moving into upper level. But it's really exciting. We're really, at, I mean, the just the, the response of the industry has been fantastic. That's great. One final question for you guys I'd like you both to answer. Besides mentorships, what can we do individually and as an industry to help combat ageism or get rid of it completely? I think one of the biggest things is, and we kind of discussed this in our, in our talk leading up to the show, is just being aware of these unconscious biases that exist, whether you think they are a facade or not like they, they're real and they play a role in kind of how you perceive people and how you're interacting with individuals and so just I think recognizing that these these biases exist and um, being aware of them in your own interactions allows you to be more open-minded when you're talking to different people of different ages different colors of skin, different genders it's it's across I mean ageism is our discussion here today but it's it's across all of these categories um, that exist. And so I think bringing awareness and having a, a cognizant awareness of these things will really diffuse your, your open-mindedness to, to interacting with people and what can they bring me that I don't already know. Because young people have a novel input. Old people have incredible wisdom and experience. And so that's one thing that I've really implemented in my interactions is like everybody I'm working with has a unique skill set that they bring to the table. What can I learn from you? And to her point, how can I network? An event like this is wonderful. Being in front of people, being in front of customers, partners in the industry, it is so great to be able to see people that you email a lot or interact with online. It's like, now I know a little bit about you, your personality, and it, it helps further diffuse some of these biases that, that you might have had before meeting them. And so that's a big Absolutely. one. Linda? No, that's great and completely agree with you. If you're alive and you're actually cognizant and have experience, you have bias. It, it, no matter what, you could say you don't, but everybody has some unconscious bias and it's being aware and having that self-awareness. But again, being open-minded and making a conscious effort to perhaps partner with someone. Of, so having a more experienced individual partner with a younger, newer individual coming into the organization, or as you said, it could be gender, it could be, be race, but making an, an effort to actually sit down and learn, you know, whether it's with having lunch together or maybe kind of developing a team that is very diverse from an age, age perspective. So really, I think it, it, it's up to the individuals to reach out and open up and actually have those conversations or we're not going, you know, or this could, you know, there'd be a bigger divide in the end. So it really is being conscious and, and working on that in a very um, focused way. Absolutely agree. You guys, I really, really appreciated you both being here with me today. Um, it was a really great conversation and uh, I look forward to having more with you. And for the folks who are tuning in, stay tuned. Our next guest will be Harper Hall. 
We are back in the Supply Side studio at Supply Side West. We're continuing the conversations about JEDI, that's justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'm here with Harper Hall, the best dressed, might I add, <laughs> at the whole entire Supply Side West. I'm just gonna say that, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Now, you know, I'm going to be caught on camera, not behind the potted plant. We were just talking about the, the greenery, the lovely greenery on stage. And uh, yeah, now I'm going to blush and, and not, I'm fully visible. Thank you. So Harper <laughs> Hall is your project leader for taste applications at Ingredient. And you're also on the board at Naturally Proud Network. So I know that you were just a little bit ago, you were way <laughs> across the way at the Fina Theater. <laughs> <laughs> but you were talking about what an inclusive industry looks like, and now you're joining me talking about um, LGBTQ plus and uh, entrepreneurs. So full disclosure, I identify with the LGBTQ plus community. I can't say it, but I identify with it. <laughs> and um, when we had a conversation uh, previous to this, um, I was saying I really didn't even know that this industry had discrimination based on sexual, you know, your sexual orientation. So please talk, I would love to, I'm sure that the thing is, I think that the majority of people, they really don't know that it exists unless they experience it firsthand or they know somebody who it has affected. So can you talk about some of the challenges that uh, entrepreneurs face? Yeah, and I, I think it's important to, thank you for mentioning that I was just speaking about how do we create um, a more inclusive um, environment, right, in which, in which we work with the industry. Um, mentioning the LGBTQIA plus community, uh, a lot of people don't realize, I, this is maybe my own bias, I'll be transparent on that as I say it. Um, there is a huge demographic, diverse demographic that is all put together within the community, right, and falls under that alphabet. Each one of those letters means something specific. There is actually the ability to have intersectionality and experience yeah. um, multiple uh, identities within the community as a result of that. And it took me a while to realize that because I do have an experience intersectionality uh, within the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, why it is such a large pile of letters also is important because visibility, um, understanding, you know, the I is for intersex people, right? And intersex awareness is actually, actually it is Intersex Awareness Day or Visibility Day internationally recognized. So it's, it's so critical to understand what people are facing, how we need to support different uh, different groups, different uh, folks to um, get to equity, right? A little, a little bit easier. And we don't get there until we start to have these conversations and then share ideas back and forth, right? So this is a lot of the work that Naturally Proud Network is aiming to do, not just create spaces to gather, um, not just to uh, educate, Hopefully, right, last night having the community center come on stage with us is more than, okay, we gave a donation, that's wonderful, philanthropy, yes, and that's, that is, we are a nonprofit organization working to support and uplift others uh, where we are at who need more, right, assistance maybe than some others to again help with that equity piece of the puzzle. But hopefully the allies standing in that room, hopefully other uh, members of the community who can then also be allies, right? Like, I don't experience what a gay man experiences. I don't experience what a lesbian experiences, but I can sure as heck talk um, and use my voice to try and uplift and try to understand and listen to other community members and, and elevate those voices. So having the community uh, uh, member up there talking about their center uh, is, is critical to hopefully grabbing somebody in just that way to unlocking that awareness, right? And starting those yeah. conversations. So it's a lot of different ways to approach that, but that is one of the ways that we've been approaching it. Okay. So I know that you said that entrepreneurs, I think that you'd shared an article with me kind of talking about, because I really was, it was new to me that some entrepreneurs don't get funding or they're not able to um, you know, can you talk a little bit about that and solutions that they have, not only the, the networking, but are there other solutions? 
Right, yeah, and I mean, when we talk about other solutions, uh, there are chambers of commerce for LGBTQIA plus individuals on the, both the national level, so the NGLCC is our national in the United States uh, Chamber of Commerce, and they are connected to another Chamber of Commerce up in Canada, right? So there is that sort of network, um, but they are also a available at state and local levels. Um, so this is, is key to bringing these folks together, um, like you said, not not realizing that there's some barrier there. There are a lot of folks that are LGBTQIA plus owned organizations uh, that won't disclose that for, for safety concerns, um, you know, especially in our very visible world today, right? We have uh, websites you can go and you can research all sorts of things about individuals at, for fear that there will be lack of support, lack of customers. Um, but on the flip side of that, uh, and, and I hope it is getting a little bit better. I know there are a lot of banking institutions out there working, <laughs> going to, to places, occupying in a large way, places like Out and Equals Workplace Summit, having just been there last month myself. Um, they are on the ground trying to do the work, trying to build access uh, and, and help with that equity challenge. But there are still, if you are a small producer in a small place in farming, for instance, um, you have to do a lot of homework to find others like yourself to get the support and have doors, you know, have others help open doors for you if they find out that you are part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, so yeah, there's, there's still a lot of work to do around yeah. that space. Yeah, I know that I had another question um, about how can the industry do better? I know that you just came from this building an inclusive, um, you know, how can, how can we do better? Yeah, and in that instance, I wasn't talking specifically about the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, but having the conversations um, as realizing where your impact can be, what your impact is actually in the first place, realizing the amount of power that you have in your words, uh, where you are, you can do harm or you can do harm reduction, right? And, and you can practice and that's something that takes some conscious awareness to try and practice and then grace for yourself. Um, because you're not going to get it right every time for everybody, but hopefully you, as, as you embark on trying to create better understanding, you yourself are operating to meet folks um, in the spaces who are of a different demographic and a different experience and share ideas, right? Um, because I cannot be as aware as I need to be. You can research, yes, you know, and I encourage people if you're curious about a different demographic group that might need a little bit more assistance than another, find that information, look into it. But you, I mean, nothing beats the human tangible aspect of networking and getting to know one another, right? So, yeah. and you carry those with you, all those little nuggets, and then you spread them out more. So there's amplification that happens as a result of that, right? Naturally Proud Network. Tell me, how did that come to fruition? Um, because that is a really great resource, right? Yeah. For folks, so, um, yeah, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I kind of like, oh my gosh, <laughs> hearing that one, because my journey's been a little bit of a wild one. Um, Frank was on stage yesterday explaining. Fabulous, yeah, I love Frank to pieces, he's wonderful. Um, Frank Tillette from Nixera, and thank you to Nixera, thank you to Ingredion, thank you to all of our organizations that are standing behind us, allowing us to do this work, because without that, we wouldn't even be able to be doing what we're doing today and here at the show. Um, uh, he spoke about the founding of the group. I didn't know it even existed really until the later half, actually it was Supply Side West in 2019. Okay. So not just the later half of 2019, very specific time. Um, and I was brought in by one of my colleagues who's not here with me at the show, unfortunately today, but Kurt Callahan, I love you. <laughs> I said that on stage. Um, <laughs> But he was instrumental in changing my career. He told me I could lead Pride at Ingredion, and I ended up being the global president. And through that part of the journey, because um, I told him the whole way I couldn't, but <laughs> I did uh, in part. And uh, he also brought me to Naturally Proud Network and said, here's this group of people 
And that actually was the first event I learned about the IA being on the end of the, the collection of letters there. Crystal looked at me and was all like, you don't know this. But, but I had never been, I had actually hidden from my own group of people, right, for fear. And, and we spoke about that, being stigmatized and, and gatekept. I represent a bisexual experience. I represent non-binary, which is hidden underneath the T the transgender community, sometimes uh, not all non-binary people consider themselves to be transgender. Um, so having that, I had a lot of fear against, you know, even to join my own community and be there and be in that yeah. spot. And so it took me a while to get there, but tremendously happy to have had the experience and be brought along the way. And here I am now. How can people learn more about Naturally Proud Network? Yeah, so you can check us out, naturallyproud.org. Um, we have a website. Uh, we are on LinkedIn. You can check us out on LinkedIn. Just look, you know, go you can even just Google Naturally Proud Network. We do come up <laughs> in the search engines. Uh, right now, we are only uh, a website and on LinkedIn. We were just discussing that in our session this morning. Um, you know, sh should we join other platforms for increasing our visibility? What are our next steps? How do we work on content creation? Uh, but Informa has been integral to us for elevating our voices because you keep time and again inviting us to talk and every time you do we are tremendously grateful you are helping us to expand our visibility and the room that we filled pretty early on last night I think shows that there's a need and um, we're going to keep going and and we're here. We are super super grateful to have you part of this conversation too Harper and uh, thanks again for joining me today. Uh, for the folks who are watching, stay tuned for our next guest will be Robin Barnett. Thanks again. Thank you. Hi, I got a new mic. We're gonna try this again. We are back in the Supply Side Studio. We're talking about Jedi justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'm here with Robin Barnett. Hello. I mean, it's really kind of perfect because you are the founder and CIO of Diversity Inspired Sales and Marketing. Yes, I, wa yes, I was <laughs> and yes, I am. <laughs> so your company really exemplifies Jedi. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about it and like how it all began, the idea behind starting this business? Sure. Well, I think it all began with me. I am diversity. <laughs> I grew up navigating those diverse places because I'm mixed and my parents would, my mom would rent the apartment or drive the car and then bring my dad in. So I started out being very aware of the spaces being diverse. So it was something that's always been important to me. And the business, I thought, what a better place to get people involved in educating on different cultures. It's like food unity can change the world. I believe it. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be, there are some really cool things that you have on your website. So I've written them down. I didn't memorize them. So I'm going to be looking. I see that it says um, on your website, diversityinspiredsalesandmarketing.com, mm -hmm. uh, that your passion and mission are to take inclusive, mission-driven, visionary, and diversity-inspired CPG brands courageously and successfully to market and beyond. Like, that sounds amazing. Fun, and right? And how do you do that? <laughs> well, goodwill, education, bringing... The br bringing different brands to different stores. I usually start with smaller stores and then grow them into bigger. Right now I'm working with a new company and it's all about educating people about the women farmers and the fact that this company really wants to bring healthy, organic, nutritious food to the masses and they've lowered their prices so everyone has, a, has access to it. So that's my passion again so sometimes you take a little pivot in life and for good reason yeah I think that uh, you sent me a message and said that you just yes uh, jumped on this new gig as is it sales direct, director of direct, sales director yes. of sales very mm -hmm. cool that's yeah. awesome congrats on that thank you so yeah. much um, another one of the things um, we talked about intersectionality uh, we had a conversation on the phone I guess it was like a month ago or a little mm -hmm. bit over a month ago 
you identify your company as a black woman-owned business. So yes, how important is intersectionality to you personally and then the work that you do? As a woman, as a woman of color, and as a black woman, although I'm very ambiguous, I think it's really important, especially for me, to be in those spaces and navigate them for other people and show them that we belong here. You know, as a woman, we have a little, we have work to do, but I want to be part of that work. I always want to be of service, and I'm just passionate about this industry, and I think that these buyers really have the power. I know it sounds so simple, but we all like to eat. We all love food. We all have memories of food. I mean, I'm sure you have oh dishes gosh, from yeah. your grandmother, from your aunties, and um, I do too. If we bring them together, then I think it'll be global kindness through food unity. That's my whole goal. I know that we have like Thanksgiving coming up and Christmas. I'm all of a sudden I'm craving a, a popcorn ball. <laughs> some some <laughs> of my grandma's fudge. <laughs> See, right? And so. My, half my family is, I love the collard greens and the sweet potatoes. You know, I get, everyone has certain foods that bring back so many good memories. Yeah. So the other quote that I saw on your site that I love, by the way, you're good. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. You wrote, I believe we can work together to create a more inclusive, diverse, tolerant, and compassionate planet, one taste bud at a time. Absolutely. So uh, tell us about that and what do you think is required to make that happen? Education and embracing different cultures and different food. It all comes back to the food. I love to eat. <laughs> but everyone does. It all comes back to the food, right? So yeah. if we meet on this level, tasting each other's food, what can be better than that? Unity and food. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to keep pushing forward. <laughs> so Robin, how do people connect with you? Probably the best way is on LinkedIn, Robin Barnett on LinkedIn, um, robin.barnett at wildfair.com, and, uh, or just text me, call me <laughs> up. <laughs> you know, we can all find anyone, right? <laughs> Anything else that you'd like to share? We've got the live stream. The stage is yours. Oh, well, we're going to do a mashup now. <laughs> right? No? Harper, I think Harper just left. Wait. We do have, look at the. <clears throat> Great minds. I mean, come on. <laughs> it was a pleasure having you here. Thank you really so much. Really wonderful meeting you. You too. And, uh, Stay tuned for the next guest. We're going to have Thank you. Sarah Aurora joining us. Bye-bye. Supply Sideways is a go-to show every single year. It's a great place to, um, to meet potential buyers and to network. It's nice to you know, bring back everybody and, and really be here and meet people and talk and do business together. Environmental sustainability is vital for the well-being of our people and our planet. It is becoming increasingly more important that we preserve resources like clean air, water, and wildlife for our future generations. As event organizers, we recognize that our trade shows have an impact on the environment, so we hold a responsibility to identify and understand and address these impacts and create ways to become a more planet-forward event. Supply Side serves the health and nutrition sector with our customers operating at various points in the market supply chain. They are wanting to source and manufacture and distribute products in ways that are more regenerative. They are reevaluating their distribution models to lower their carbon footprint and meet new standards, as well as considering more sustainable packaging options. 
We're addressing many of the same challenges as our customers around carbon footprint, waste, and responsible sourcing. For the second year in a row, we're partnering with the Las Vegas Tree Initiative to literally green the show floor. As you walk down the main cross aisles, you'll notice heat-resistant trees and plants. These will be donated post-show to the city of Las Vegas, where they'll be replanted in parts of the city that are most affected by the urban heat crisis. And then in turn, they'll help bring down temperatures and provide shade in those areas. This year, we decided to completely eliminate our expo previews, which are normally printed and mailed to more than 30,000 potential customers. Instead, we really ramped up our digital marketing efforts to still reach that audience, but significantly reduced our waste production. One other thing that's new this year is the introduction of the Better Stands Initiative. This is an Informa-wide effort to unite and encourage our exhibitors along Welcome back to the Supply Side Studio here at Supply Side West. Uh, we are talking about JEDI, which is Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion. And I'm here with Sarah Rohr. Yes. You are project manager of One Step Closer, which I believe was kind of like the brainchild or the, the originator of JEDI Collaborative. What conversation about JEDI wouldn't be complete without talking about JEDI Collaborative? So, Sarah, welcome. And I would love to hear what what is Jedi Collaborative and how did it come to be? Um, the Jedi Collaborative was formed by OSC um, with the founders and a group of experts around creating framework to ensure that all those principles, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion are embedded in businesses and primarily our focus is the natural product industry but really setting up to ensure that there's representation, support, celebration um, of everyone that makes up our amazing industry. Um, and so that idea kicked off in 2019, um, meeting with experts and the Ivana group that helped develop our programming. Um, it sort of soft launched in 2020 and we had about 60 companies make JEDI commitments using the framework and then we went to a full launch in 2021 uh, with our online platform and it's been continuing since then. That's great. Um, I know that <clears throat> what if you were to explain like given examples of what JEDI Collaborative does. Um, so it's a resource for organizations that are looking to improve, embed, or audit their current JEDI statements and commitments or in developing them. Um, it's got a range of programming available or frameworks available um, depending on where companies are at, what they would like to achieve, and the commitment from their team as well. Um, ideally, that commitment comes from the leader and is embedded throughout the organization, but also supporting individuals in embedding it within their teams. Um, and so we look to serve those that are, have the interest and the need and also ensure it's as accessible as possible. Ideally, it's a standard. So are they training? Are they courses? Are they classes? What is the what are the, the, the offerings? So um, like a course framework, so we have a self-paced online completely free framework where a company or an individual from an organization can go through and it's sets out their steps towards developing JEDI commitment and standards. And then we have other courses, whether they're self-paced online courses, such as our Jumpstart Pathway or our Trailblazer, which is a more interactive, higher commitment, um, multiple months. We've, last one's been about six months, um, but an ongoing learning program um, facilitated by our wonderful director of JEDI. Um, and then we also have some other programs that are shorter, such as the CEO Action Initiative, um, that really target that high level leader and encourage discussion about how everyone's doing it, what challenges there are, what developments there are. 
um, and what we can, you know, learn from that and adapt. Excellent. Um, on the website, I was reading jedicollaborative.com. I saw that you have several goals and a timeline that's actually yeah. listed for <laughs> accomplishing some really important benchmarks. So I, it, the timeline started in 2019 and goes until 2030. So how ambitious were the, those goals and are you currently on target to achieve the ones that are, the next ones are 2025? Yeah, which is coming around very quickly. Yes. <laughs> um, those goals were ambitious, but we want to be ambitious with this. We don't want this to be a small splash in the pond. Um, we, the time frame to current has been really well and currently now we're looking at how we can expand and work with our partnership organisations to help spread the word and be, um, to continue to be a collaborative as well instead of us just, you know, solely putting it out. We want to work with others, we want their feedback, we want to be able to share it with their members or their organisations um, and, you know, save some of the work on them as well because a lot of people are doing it and we want to collaborate and not have everyone reinventing the wheel. Um, so hopefully we are on track for our 2025 and 2030. Um, Do you know what some of those benchmarks are, the one for 2025? Um, in terms of the number of commitments, we had a very high number for the total organisations. Um, and I think, you know, spreading that to be a... Um, a quantity that goes beyond just the commitments set out by Jedi Collaborative and that traditional structure, but you know, adapting um, as we've found that throughout the last few years of programming, um, that we want those commitments, but we also want to be appreciative of the time that we're in. So another question that I have for you are, do you have any exciting new developments? Like, tell us, give us the goods. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do. So, um, Jedi Collaborative is part of OSC, and uh, somewhat of a joint venture of OSC and Jedi Collaborative has been. What is OSC? Uh, so OSC people? is one step closer. Okay. Um, so, an organization that supports leaders within the natural products yeah. industry. Um, and so, initially, it started with Jedi, and it was also now including. Um, OSC is our women's leadership circle um, which we have opening up for 2024. It's occurred over the last three years with like a soft pilot launch um, and it's really grown and we've sort of tried to cultivate a safe space for both professional and personal development um, focusing on women and some of the challenges that are faced, but also just opening up the opportunities such as having hard conversations, how to have them, and what is, you know, for a lot of males perhaps, that is just what they would do. But really opening up and being like, this is what we can do, and this is how we do it, and this is a place to converse and support one another. Um, and so we have that coming up, and that's been something that's just developed and expanded, sort of exceeded our expectations so we're really excited to see where that can go and to continue to be an aspect of our Jedi commitment as well. That's wonderful. So how can people learn more about Jedi Collaborative and get involved? Um, so our website jedicollaborative.com or um, osc2.org as well. They both will get you there. Um, they both have all the information about the programs, um, the steps to either register for interest or enroll, um, and my contact details are also on there. If there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Wonderful. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sonia, for And having... for all of you in the live stream, join us in just a couple minutes for our next guest, Mike Seeley. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Sonia. Welcome back to Supply Side Studio at Supply Side West. We are here with Mike Seeley. You are the VP of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Informa Markets. I mean, that's a really great way to kind of, you know, round off these great conversations about Jedi. 
Um, so we've been talking about people or talking from people, hearing, but how about our own house? So this is Informa Market Supply Side puts this on. Before we dig into what Informa Markets does with Jedi, I want to hear about your personal journey. Mm. How did you become VP of Diversity Inclusion? That's a really good question, actually. Um, and thanks for inviting me. It's good to be here. My whole career, um, somewhere along the line, has involved diversity and inclusion. Whether that's been helping to set up um, employee resource groups or heading them up. Um, right through my career from HP through to Microsoft, BBC, I've always played a part somewhere along the lines in diversity, equity and inclusion. So when it came to Informa Markets, I, I started here as the Director of Customer Experience. Then of course we saw the George Floyd event, saw a lot more activity in, in the company and then they decided that they were going to have somebody head this up. So that's when I took the opportunity to apply. And here I am. That's wonderful. Wasn't it just, it was earlier this year, wasn't it, that you had um, moved into the new role? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Uh, beginning of last year. Beginning of last year, yeah. okay. I look on LinkedIn, but, <laughs> but <laughs> I wasn't as prepared, but I was looking at kind of your journey and I was yeah. really curious. That was the first question that I wanted to ask you, so yeah. Um, your role is leading in foreign markets, DEI strategy, that's diversity, equity, and inclusion. So can you tell us about that? What is the strategy? Yeah, well, it's interesting. When I first took this role on, I didn't realize how big DEI was. You know, I've always been passionate about it, partly from my own lived experiences, but partly from trying to make sure that we can create an inclusive environment for our people. So when I got this role, one of the first things I thought was, what do I do? Because there are so many elements to diversity, equity and inclusion. So I spent time talking to each of our presidents, finding out what they were looking for, what they were expecting. And then I came up with a strategy that looked at what we did internally as a company, but also how we represented externally. So I created a number of programs for our colleagues internally, but also externally as well. So it's made up of overall trying to drive and create an inclusive and respectful culture. Yeah, wonderful. And I know that you were just kind of um, spoke a little bit about that, that some of the DEI focus areas for 2023 that we're in currently, and how about forward facing into 2024? Are there other things that are in the works? Oh, absolutely. Um, certainly this year has been a, a real busy year. We've done programs like Diverse Voices on Stage where we're trying to ensure that we do have diversity in our speakers at all of our events. I created a, a training program for all of our colleagues, which is a certification program um, for all of our colleagues to hopefully register and, and complete. Um, and also created um, an age discrimination program. So we became um, certified as an age diversity employer, and that includes a lot of training to hiring managers um, and the Diversity Org program where we're bringing students to all of our events, mainly from underrepresented groups that will allow them to have a potential opportunity for a career in any of the industries where we serve. So that's been this year. As I move into next year, one of the main things that I want to deliver is a DE&I fundamentals for all of our events, very similar to what we're doing with the sustainability. So it allows us to ensure that at all of our events, we have a diverse lens on how we deliver our shows. And then on top of that, as one or two smaller things, I'm trying to get more focus on well-being for all of our colleagues, making sure that people do stop and take care of themselves and their health, particularly in this industry where you, know, you have a show like Supply Side West and it's full on for a lot of people. So we need people to take a step back sometimes and really think about their own uh, health and well-being. And then I'm trying to drive an awareness program around neurodiversity. 
because I do believe we have a lot of people who may be neurodiverse in some way, but we need to learn how to better support them and make sure that we are creating an inclusive environment for them as well. So does that involve a lot of training and education for the people who, for you, uh, for example, yeah. or for people who are running um, the Yeah, programs? well for myself, what I've found in this job that I am constantly learning, you know, it's an education for me. I, by no way, shape or form am I an expert in diversity, equity and inclusion. So I'm learning every single day, but I'm enjoying learning about different aspects. Um, I also created my own podcast show called Diversity Matters and I interview different guests on many different subjects. They're either experts talking about a specific aspect or they're just ordinary people sharing their own personal experiences which can be inspiring for others to listen to. So that's something I'm also sharing with the company. How can people find that podcast, Mike? So the podcast is called Diversity Matters. It's available on many of the podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, etc. And hopefully, if you're internal, you should be able to find it on, on our portal. Okay, I want to go back to uh, what you were saying about the initiatives that we have for 2023, mm -hmm. because right before we started, um, before we started recording and live streaming, Mike was saying that his day earlier today, you guys did where you brought some students in. Yes. I would love to hear, because you said it was wonderful. Please tell uh, the people watching about that and kind of you know how it turned out. That would, we'd love to hear yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So we work in partnership with a fantastic organization, a young company called the Diversity Org. And they have been working with high school and college students for the last nine years. They bring these students and connect them with Fortune 500 companies. And they normally take the students to the corporate offices of those companies. And those companies then share what they do. They, they provide access. When I met with Joshua Pierce, who's the CEO, I loved the idea, but I thought, rather than bring them to our own corporate offices, bring them to our shows. Then they get the opportunity to really experience the industry. They get to meet experts and panel discussions, a bit of networking. We also give them a tour of the show floor, where they then get to connect with a number of uh, exhibitors around the floor. But then they go away on a high. And we have run this program several times over now uh, here in North America, and it's been successful every single time. The students love it, the exhibitors love it, our show teams love it, and they want more. So when they continue, you saw to some it. really happy students earlier today. Oh, absolutely! They were buzzing today. I mean, and all of these students came to this event not knowing too much about this industry of Supply Side West, but then leaving knowing a lot more than they did. And that's the idea because in their minds now, when they start to think about their own careers in the future, this could be an industry that they may be attracted to. That's so great. So final question for you, Mike. How can people learn more about Informa Markets DEI efforts? Certainly, well, if you're a colleague of the company, you know, we have lots of resources like our portal is the DEI uh, portal on the Informer Markets website. We send out newsletters externally. Uh, go onto our website, informermarkets.com, and we have bits of information and videos there that really share what we're doing. And of course, we communicate a lot in trade magazines and industry news magazines as well. So there's, there's lots of places you can go to learn about what we're doing. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate you being here. And I feel incredibly proud to be a part of such a wonderful organization. Um, also, I'm proud to be able to introduce the next person who's gonna be on our virtual supply side studio, Dr. LaMondre Pugh. So please keep watching as we switch over to the pre-recorded conversation about JEDI. We're gonna kind of bring it all together um, the words that I'd like to leave you with today, everyone, that I've borrowed from Dr. LaMondre Pugh is be brave, be smart, and be kind. Thank, take care, everyone, and uh, thanks for watching. Happy Supply Side West.
I am super excited and extremely grateful to be having a conversation about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion with Dr. Lamandre Pugh, uh, who I'm just going to be affectionately calling Lamandre, if that's okay. It's perfectly fine. Uh, now, Lamandre isn't in the Supply Side studio today or at Supply Side West, and he isn't in the health and nutrition supplement or food and beverage industries. But, and this is why I wanted to loop him into the conversation. Lamandre is a Jedi expert. He consults and trains organizations, not industry specific, telling them why Jedi is important and how they can do better. Now, prior to this recording, Lamandre and I had a conversation about some of the other speakers and the topics that were gonna be covered in the studio today. And he had some really great things to say um, that kind of brought everything together. So let's start there, Lamandre. Absolutely. First of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to to participate uh, uh, in this event. And you know, I'm, I'm very passionate um, about Jedi. I'm passionate about the about the, the the issues that surround that, and 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 how we move how we move forward. Uh, as a people. And just to give you a little bit of background about myself, the reason that is, is because I am a person with a disability. And when I was 18 years old, I was thrust into a world that was not necessarily that welcoming or accessible um, to people like me. And I experienced culture shock. And from that point on, I sat on a journey um, to do what I could to make a difference in the world. You know, the saying that says, be the change that you want to see. Well, I took that to heart. And so for over the past 25 years, uh, this is what I've dedicated my life to really focusing in on disability. And I'll tell you, I I'm happy to have this conversation with you, um, Sony, because in looking at the other topics of the sessions and, and, and looking at what the speakers um, are bringing uh, to, this, to this event, there's a common theme that runs through all of that. And, and I'm going to share with you some, some ideas and some insights and some takeaways today that uh, the things that you can apply in your practice and what you do on a daily basis to really help, um, help create more inclusive environments where justice reigns and diversity is not only appreciated or, 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 or embraced, but it's actually harnessed to help propel uh, the organization forward. I'm I'm excited about where we are, and I'm happy. I'm very happy to be a part of this today. And I want to tell you my perspective, because as I said before, I am a person with a disability. Just to give you a little bit of a little bit of background about me, I have spinal muscular atrophy, um, and spinal muscular atrophy, if you're not familiar with it, is a progressive neurological disorder. And basically what it means is that my body does not produce a specific protein that's necessary for healthy muscle growth. And what does that mean? As a result, uh, I can't bathe myself. I can't feed myself. I need help with every aspect of life. I'm a full-time wheelchair user. Um, I use a power wheelchair. The only thing that I can really run uh, is my mouth uh, and, uh, and, and thinking. And sometimes I need help with that even. But my life is dope. It is. I lead a very, very, um, a very fulfilling, a very fulfilling life. And, um, and that's not in spite of, and that's not, that's not, that, that's not in spite of a disability. No, that's rocking it with my disability. Why? Because I believe that disability is simply this. It is simply a point of diversity. It is not a negative. It is not a positive. I am not broken. I am not sick. I am simply Lamondre. And all that comes with being Lamond, right? A part of it is my disability. Now, understand something. It is not the defining point of who I am, but it's certainly a defining point of who I am. Why? Because it informs a portion of my perspective. It's a part of my experience. It's a part of, 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 of how I view the world in terms of how I interact with the world. So, no, it is not something to be... Um, looked at as a deficit, but neither is it something that should be looked at as, oh, he's so wonderful because he ate a hot dog and he's a person with a disability. Nah, it's just a part of, of who I am and it's a part of, of what makes up uh, who I am. 
So this is a this is really amazing, and again, I'm excited uh, uh, about about this event and what we're doing with Supply Side West. I was going to ask you, Lamandre, in your own words, why is Jedi important? So I think it's important because it really does bring into perspective the concept of of what it means to be just or to exhibit justice. It helps to bring in the concept of, of equity and what equity really means. It helps us to understand that by appreciating our differences and embracing and harnessing the power of that difference, what it can do for us in terms of moving us forward. And also, what does it mean to be truly inclusive? How we take inclusion to create senses and ideas and feelings of belonging. That's why I believe it's so important because this is about all of us. It's not just about people who stand out as unique or different, but it's about all of us being exactly who we are and being able to bring that to the table and exist in a world where, when we think about it, that not only are our differences recognized, but they're respected and honestly, they're promoted. So it's a beautiful thing. So Lamandre, what steps can organizations take to provide a more inclusive culture? Things I wanna leave you with, first of all, see that there is a difference. What do I mean that by that? I mean, recognize that differences exist and we, 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 we don't need to, like I like to say, we don't need to turn away from it as if they don't or try to cover it up as if they don't. And I'll give you a quick story. Inevitably, through the work that I do, I have this conversation, I've had this conversation way more times than I really care to, um, to remember. But after working with people for a while, I will inevitably hear this. Lamandre, you're very talented. You bring a lot to the table. There is so much value you bring that I don't even see your disability. Now, I want you to understand something. I am 220 pounds of bald-headed black man in a 350-pound wheelchair, okay? So when I come into the room, you see that I have a disability. It, It is... It's no question. It is no question about it. But I understood the spirit in which that comment was made. I I really did. And I understood it was supposed to be a compliment, but it's not. And here's why it's not. First of all, what you're saying is there are certain beliefs that I hold about disability, that it's a negative, that it's less than, that it is a liability, but because of who you are and what you've brought to the table, I don't see any of those negatives represented in you, therefore I don't see your disability. When the truth is, you do indeed see my disability, but what you're saying is I don't see the deficits or the problems that I associate with disability. So that is a comment that is rooted really in ableism. And ableism is a concept that people with disabilities are inferior to those without disabilities. Now, there's a saying that says, passion without precision equals chaos. Well, what does that mean? That means that I have been in many situations where people have said, yes, we want to hold the banner up. We, wanna, we want to, 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 to be your ally and work with you, but they don't understand. And what they end up doing is running and making a train wreck of a situation. So the engagement piece has to start after a mutual understanding has been met. And that's an important piece of the puzzle. The other thing that I want to leave you with is find and become the champion. Let me explain to you that a little bit more in a story. When I was a kid, I grew up in rural South Carolina, and we used to play kickball out in front of my house. Now, here's the thing. I could kick, but I could not run. And so I had a friend, Dexter. Dexter was my first friend. I was his second friend, but Dexter could run. And so whenever we'd be playing kickball, he would jump up and say, I'm running for Bubba. Now, here's the thing. My nickname is Bubba. All right, so see, that's a difference, something you probably didn't expect. But no, I, I, I am a Bubba, and my nickname is Bubba. And I love the fact that Dexter would say, I'm going to run for Bubba. Because here's the thing. 
when they rolled the ball to me and I would kick it, Dexter would take off running and Dexter was fast. Dexter could run, Dexter would juke, spin, he would pivot, he would do all this stuff. So nine, nine times out of 10, he would at least make it to second base, right? And so we had a great chance of winning as a team. In that scenario, Dexter was my champion. What is a champion? A champion is someone who may not be affected by the issue, who may not be a part of the group, but they saw the difference, they sought to understand it, and the engagement was him being willing to run for me. See, here's the thing. There are people with a specific circle of influence or sphere of influence. There are people with certain privileges who, when they see the difference, they've understood the difference, and they've engaged with it, they can open doors that that individual who belongs to the group could not. They can speak out in places and bring the perspective in rooms that you would have never had access to. They then become your champion. But the flip side of that is for you to become the champion, for you to become part of organizations and groups and that, that you don't necessarily, you are not necessarily dealing with that issue, but you've seen the difference. You've understood it and you've engaged in it and you're willing to use your influence. You're willing to use your privilege to make a difference for them. You see, that speaks to the unity of it all. Because what would it look like if the only time I ever spoke up about something was only about the times when it impacted me personally. That means when things came up for me, I, I'm the only voice there. But if I'm also speaking out for others, I have become their champion. I'll have champions when it's time for me. Lamandre, I always enjoy conversations with you. Is there any words that you'd like to leave us with today? You know what? I think that the, the main thing about this is that we're all in this together. And that by embracing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, what that does is it just does not, it is not making it right for a special set aside group of people. This is about all of us. This is about every single one of us. This is about how we grow our businesses. This is about getting perspectives and creating environments that spawn innovation, that spawn growth in times of change. You see, it's those different perspectives. It's those different lived experiences that help us come together and come up with solutions and, and situations that we might not have thought about if everything was always about where well, this is the way that we've always done it. 